So before I start, I just want to remind people that may be listening online to in the chat box to drop your questions there. Um, somebody here will probably give them to me. And then the people here in the venue, please uh, just raise your hands. I'm sure there's plenty of uh, questions to be asked. Just shout if you need anything. And then just to get the ball rolling, um, I jotted down here enough to keep us busy for the rest of the evening, so I hope nobody's in a hurry. But uh, I've heard two different things here. Stewardship, when Kulani started to talk, you know, there's the things that we know, and I got to know the word stewardship when we started to, uh, to talk about biotechnology or about biotechnology. So my first question to you, Kulani, is just stewardship in the absence of biotechnology. Yeah. Is there something like that? Or stewardship just about biotech trades and looking at new technology things? And I, before you answer then, I would like to, Barney, just to follow up on that and to say from your perspective then. So I just want to play off a little bit the whole concept about stewardship and, you know, yeah, now these new technologies, we should look at them. And then there's a general thing, and I think some of the things that Dani said relates to that. We have a general responsibility of being good stewards of the environment, and he has a farmer, specifically the environment there. So I just want to play those two things off against each other, please. Yes, so definitely, yes, stewardship is much broader than agricultural biotechnology stewardship. It's about responsible use of agricultural products. It can be through farming practices. Even if we are using conventional crops, we can use certain farming practices that have adverse impact on the environment, and we try and minimize that. It's just that with agricultural biotechnology trees coming into commercialization, the industry took it to the next level. Hence the implementation of the Excellence Through Stewardship pro pro Program, which is focusing more only on biotech trees. But when we discuss stewardship with the farmers, we are not focusing only on ag biotech. Thank you so much. Barney, you? So I'd like to concur with that. Uh, I mean, over time, we've learned that uh, we need to change our relationship with the environment in general. So, you know, the, the way we um, interact, consume, and so on. So clearly, it's a, it's a no-brainer that uh, stewardship actually has to be an innate thing and it has to be part of our uh, everyday, uh, you know, actions. And uh, climate change is a very good example of how actually... Um, you know, through our activities, uh, as as we basically overlooked our relationship with the earth system, you know, how we contributed to the problem. And so now, as I said, over time we've learned and we are starting now to change our ways to realize that, uh, you know, stewardship actually is, uh, has to be part of our, um, you know, daily lives and, 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 and in, in everything that we do, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yes, I wanted to add to what you say. I think, especially from your perspective as uh, you know, a custodian of the environment of South Africa in some form at least, uh, what you said obviously fits 100% with that because you have a, a much wider responsibility than just the, the stuff within uh, agriculture. But then in agriculture, and uh, I mean part of uh, your introduction and where you work is invasives, for example, and all those things. So stewardship... I, I like the idea that we're discussing stewardship also in a broader context. Yes. That, you know, the um, GM uh, crops, for example, is not the, the exception to the rule. Mm. And, and then I want to follow up with this, and I'm just going to stay with the, the, them for a little while. Um, but can you just explain to the people that are listening to, um, obviously we have a technology developer. Mm -hmm. One of the important aspects of the development of the product is that, um, development of the, the biosafety yes. data and ensuring that it, you have a sustainable product. Mm -hmm. You submit that, it goes in our system to a regulatory authority mm -hmm. where they also assess that then. Yes. Is that assessment then a formal part of what... My question, wanna, and then I want to come down to yes. who tells you what to check for stewardship? Because you mentioned things like herbicide tolerance, for example, and insect tolerance. Yes. 
But what about the other things? Where does the information come from yes. that we need to focus on in terms of stewardship? Okay, I, I will say the reference standard was what was developed a few years ago when biotech trees came into the market, the guidelines from the OECD Blue Book. So those set the standards for many companies to follow. But there is much more than what are minimum regulatory requirements that the companies are doing. So before we get to the commercialization phase, Usually there's 10 years of research before the product is submitted for commercialization. And many products, as was explained earlier in the day, they don't make it because maybe those criteria that have been set for assessment of potential adverse impact on the environment, non-target species, it's, it's not meeting the standard. Then the products get dropped. So there's a battery of tests that are done and then those additional tests are then submitted to the regulatory authorities based on what the authorities need to see. But in most cases, additional data is submitted that shows adverse impact, that non-adverse impact on the environment, human health, animal health, and so on. So uh, to summarize, there's the standard that's set by the regulatory guidelines, and there's the work that is being done privately in addition to that, to support a particular application. Okay. Yeah. And then, Barney, just quickly then, a follow-up question to you is, if you then, uh, you refer to bio, um, um, can you believe I've got the word biodiversity, can you believe it? Biodiversity. Biodiversity is obviously important things, and, and it's a basis of many things that you do. So how do we focus on what, aspects, because biodiversity is also a very broad term. And when I think of biodiversity, I think of the, exactly the, the pictures that you had in your slide, you know, the, the floral kingdom and the cape and things like that. But how do we get away from that broad kind of idea of, you know, we just have to protect the environment to things that we can implement that both the technology, because they are responsible now for this technology, and then the farmer in the end of the day, that they can translate into practice, actually. So, so I think that's a very uh, good and uh, an important question. I mean, this is a big and a complex space, you know, the, the biodiversity uh, space. So that, that's where now the science comes in, in terms of uh, assisting us uh, to identify uh, what one would refer to as a uh, assessment uh, endpoints so that we are clear uh, because that enables us to um, uh, be clear how we regulate and so that the people who are regulated understand you know they are regulated based on what and um, uh, the process is clearly defined to them and so so that 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 because communication and understanding some sometimes it's where you know uh, the issues uh, come up and makes it uh, difficult either for the regulator or for the person who's regulated. So development of assessment endpoints and uh, measures such as risk assessment uh, continuously are critical and key in in uh, you know making sure that uh, you know the regulatory process is clear and people know what to do. Yeah. Uh, I'm just quickly going to read off a question that we got online here. Marnes Gauze, a question to uh, Prof. Phillips. is uh, what in your view is the future of glyphosate? And then it was added by Ben and glyphosinate in world agriculture. Both chemicals are, are core part of the, the GM uh, technology today, uh, Roundup and Liberty. They're used quite extensively both with GM crops and in some cases as burnoff chemicals in, in non-GM circumstances. So they're, they're part of the space and, and they, they're actually, they're a nice segue to this question of stewardship because all chemicals have the potential to generate resistance or, or biotic or, uh, responses in, in, in the spaces in which they're used. So part of, of stewardship is going beyond just is it legal to, today and is it efficacious today, but to ensure the sustainability of the technology across its, its, its application and, it, and its use. So, so part of that's things like uh, 
you know, in in very practical terms in, that I've seen, uh, companies or, or or organizations working with companies will ensure that that old seed is with remo is removed from the market so that the deregistered seed doesn't contaminate and, and de degrade the quality of these chemicals. That the chemicals themselves, the, the, st the bits that are are not used in and left in bins or in the bins, the the, the uh, barrels themselves are removed from the environment so that they're not uh, damaging our water system. Uh, management of refusion, other which isn't related to these two chem chemicals, but to ensure that we don't create the the resistance that will degrade the quality of these technologies. Uh, resistance management is a big one, and and the companies are working with the regulators and with the scientists to ensure that where we find the resistance building up, either in the intended organism or in in you know weedy relatives or 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 coexisting plants, that we figure out a pathway and figure out a mitigation strategy to ensure that the technology doesn't uh, doesn't uh, uh, get out of control. And I guess at the end of the day, part of it's coexistence. You know, it, 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 parts of the, the world and parts of the marketplace are quite happy with products produced with those two chemicals. Other parts aren't. And it's not that one, right, one is right or one is wrong, but the, the, the sustainability of the industry is that both, that, that whatever parts you're in as a producer or as a consumer or anybody in between those two, that you're able to, to confidently and, and effectively and efficiently deliver what you, you're, you're, you want to deliver and what people want to use and, and consume. I think towards the end, you touched on a very important aspect. Of course, we sitting here talking about environmental stewardship. But in the end of the day, these products are also in a bigger context in the market, things that you referred to earlier in your, your talk. So those are also important aspects. So even though we can focus a lot on the, you know, kind of the ensuring that the environment is protected or safe mm -hmm. from the chemicals we use, it may not be the alpha and the omega of, you know, a particular technology or the use of the technology. I just quickly want to make sure that Chris can hear me because I... Glad to see you still there. Um, I've got a question for you. Often when we have a discussion about biotechnology you know, and its ability to enable, for example, the planting, you gave an example there of uh, looking at dormancy and peaches, I think you used this example, and you said now people can plant it in Florida as well. So what we would then often hear from people that focus on the environment is that they say, but now you're going to take up even more Hectrich for agriculture. What would your answer be to a, a statement like that? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So when we think about the sustainability of and the security of our food systems, so it's it's easy to just assume that it's static, that we can keep producing what the crops we're growing, where we're growing them. And the reality is, as we move forward into the future, um, we're probably not. So in California, for example, they have huge water problems now. So all these tree and nut crops they grow, they're not going to be able to continue to grow at that scale unless they solve the water problem, which is maybe a bigger challenge. So I think there's tremendous value in diversification. So having our crops produced in different places in different ways, more local production, um, at scales where people are also more connected to their food. I, I think that the industrialization of the system, in some ways, many uh, consumers, they're, they're just not as connected as they used to be in terms of where our food comes from. So, um, so I, I'm a big proponent of that kind of diversification. And what it's probably going to take to address some of these huge challenges that we have to ensure that in the future we're producing enough food in a way that's environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable. Thank you so much. I think what I like to highlight from uh, your answer is that, you know, these technologies and not the technology, uh, but the innovations in the products are context specific. I mean, you gave us very nice examples of all the different wor uh, work that you're doing, but you can't generalize any of those things. Like the example I just tried to to sketch with my question is that, you know, you're not just going to increase it, but the, the, the counterpoint of that is that it's local production. 
And one of the things that Chris actually referred to initially in his discussion is looking at the whole food system. You can also not just think of stewardship and just focus on the farm the whole time and say, you know, you should do everything there. But then you load these things in huge trucks and you transport them across the country. It doesn't make sense. Looking at the whole system. And I think, so the bottom line of the whole discussion is that products in the end of the day, this context specificity is very important. We can't just generalize, you know, say there's high production in this area will be, you know, the answer to everything. And then quickly, I want to ask a, a question to Dani, and it might be a little bit of a weird one starting off with, <laughs> but I want to ask if you the exception to the rule, because you, you spoke about regenerative farming, you said it's important to, you know, to, to repair the soil condition to where it was, you know, youngs ago. And one of the things that frustrates me often is when you also talk to people about farming in general, I'm not even just talking about genetic or biotechnology type of things, is people have this idea that farmers just, you know, are chasing every rand. So starting off by first, you know, are you different? Or is there a different kind of attitude towards farming? When did this start? this perception, if I'm correct, when did it start and kind of how do you see it? How, what is the message that you want to give to the general public basically in terms of a farmer, in terms of how you look at the environment and how you farm with the environment? Yeah, I think I am, uh, I might be the exception to the rule. Um, I think a lot of people think when, you, when you're talking to a guy that says, yeah, he's doing regenerative type stuff, it's like, you know, there's no technology. You have to go back to like the native soils, you know, in those years there weren't any technology and any chemicals done like that. But, you know, um, it's not like that. Um, I think in today's time, um, I'm one of those, those guys that uh, if I have to go no till and, uh, uh, improve soil quality and I have to use technology uh, and every uh, or any type of biotech that's available to me uh, then I'm going to do it yeah um, because a lot of times I think also because of the lack of uh, knowledge by a lot of people uh, not knowing what's going on on a farm uh, they won't know that uh, a lot of this new type of um, technologies and stuff that we do have uh, it's a safer way and uh, you know a quicker way of returning or improving I don't think we'll ever uh, get the soils to what they was um, but you know that is a it's a it's a faster safer way just to get the soils back uh, hopefully into a more productive sustainable way um, that uh, that it was uh, like in previous times yeah so and um, I think uh, there, there's sometimes, you know, it's like if you, uh, there's like a type of uh, uh, a thing added, like if you're going this, uh, if you're farming in a certain way, there are a set of rules that you have to, att uh, you, you have to attend to, yeah, and you can't uh, steer away from them. And that's one of the biggest things I think in farming that uh, there's no white paper or no anything set of rules. You have to adapt. Uh, and if you can't adapt to that, even if it sometimes means, you know, breaking the rules or moving out of the rules, if you're not going to do that, uh, you won't uh, be farming for, for long, yeah. yeah. Uh, just to follow up on that, I just got a, uh, another question online from uh, Dave Berger that asked, how do you monitor the soil quality on your farm over the long term? Uh, you no, know, that is a uh, over long term. Uh, we have to do soil tests, and uh, I think the uh, soil test is like the you know the technical way of looking at it. But uh, I think also financially, um, if you're not doing some uh, things correctly, um, it won't it won't reflect financially. But yeah, um, looking at what the yields were um, a few years ago to where we are now, uh, you know the amount of uh, uh, the amount of uh, kilograms we are producing per millimeter of rain and um, precision farming really made um, made a lot of uh, of the uh, keeping record on a lot of that stuff made it really uh, easy to see to to see if you're making any uh, progress or not yeah so uh, the more data um, I'm a data farmer um, the more data that I can uh, uh, can collect on my farm and analyze it and look at it um, to see if uh, uh, if I'm going forward, because uh, if you're if you're going forward, a lot of times it will be because of the soils that you are improving. Um, so all of the results that you're getting uh, is a result from what's going on in your soils. Thank you so much, um, Barney. I'm coming back to you because I've got two questions here that relate to, to to government policy. So the first one is not really a question. I think it's a it's a statement more 
by Ntagazeni and Tsidada that um, suggest that we need a, a regional uh, meeting and a discussion about uh, you know, the potential of and how we're going to utilize kind of a, I, I, my own interpretation of this is you know, developing like a regional policy for the use of biotech to uh, you know, talk to the climate crisis. And then the second one relates, in the same context, I would say, uh, a question from Ben that asks uh, what is being done to create an enabling regulatory environment for products of genome editing. In the context, I would assume that this may be one of the technologies that we can address the climate change. So yeah. they're putting you on the spot here, yeah, but it's about the policy <laughs> and, environment. And it's delivery rate for that matter, both of them. <laughs> um, so, so I think I, I fully concur with the, the need for a regional, uh, one could call it regional engagement strategy, which we have in place uh, to mobilize our neighbors as well, um, you know, in the context of uh, this technology, but from an environment uh, perspective as well, given other international developments like, uh, you know, the supplementary uh, protocol on liability and, you know, so I think that's important. Um, uh, but uh, mainstreaming climate change into that, of course. Um, so so, so that, 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 that actually ensures consistency in the region and it also, you know, uh, contributes uh, to issues of trade as well, you know, with our neighbors and m make sure that there's that it's, it's a, Things are seamless, and um, there's there's a there's a, a you know sort of strategy that uh, possibly nudges us towards a, a policy that uh, harmonizes uh, things in the in, in in the region. So I think uh, arguably, well, I mean this this is a relatively uh, you know, and and I'm careful here, a new technology from you know, the environment uh, perspective, because, um, you know, we are learning and uh, we are, that is why we actually have made it a point that research is pivotal for us to this, to guide us, you know, properly in terms of how do we regulate things from a regulator, sorry, from an environment uh, perspective. So I think uh, in time, uh, things will evolve because we are in a space that is not static, you know, it's constantly evolving. So it has to evolve as guided by science, which is our best uh, tool that is available to us. So, yeah, I'm, I'm positive that, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, as time evolves, uh, things will evolve and we'll get there, yeah. 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 I think uh, while you answering the question, I, I'm reminded of the, the slides that we saw in the, the first session where our big export markets are, especially when we talk about foods. So the first place, climate impact is going to be a regional thing. It's right. not right. <laughs> going to be stopped by borders. Right. The second place is that, so that there's almost a responsibility if you are, this is my personal view, but there's a responsibility if you are able to utilize and people are actually depending on you for their imports to ensure, you know, it's not just, we, it's not only us that's going to be affected right. by that. Right our close neighbors in the region are going to be impacted by it. Right. So it just makes a, a lot of sense for me that this is the type of discussion that should obviously be done on a, right. a regional yeah. basis. And I forgot to look up. Is there any questions? Maybe, maybe there's one to, at the back there, to... please. And there's another one. Sorry. Uh, so we'll start with Ben, then we'll come back to you. Hi, Bongani. I see it's you. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Testing? Test this. Great. <laughs> I just wasn't talking. <laughs> Thanks very much. Really interesting panel discussion. Two, two uh, well, one question and, and a comment more. Um, to our remote speaker, the virtual speaker, um, the mind dump kind of rehabilitation or reutilization. Um, we, we have a lot of mind dumps, at least in this province of South Africa, and um, the, the problem with their use is heavy metal uptake. So I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, that obviously must have been an issue. I don't know if you had experience with that, um, of heavy metal uptake into your crop plants. Um, and then the comment is, 
Dr. Kronewald, our moderator, and I attended a conference uh, a few years ago where I was advocating that given the, the changing developments in the world and uh, climate change and everything else, biotechnology is not really a luxury anymore. It's becoming a necessity. But, but the, the line I suggested was that we should stick to domesticated crops and animals. The, at that very conference, there was a presentation on Lyme disease in, in the US where I think it's a rat-borne disease uh, in, in tick, ticks from, from rats. The, the presentation was on modifying the rats to be resistant some, somehow. Sorry, I don't recall the detail. So already there was talk on, on uh, how the wild populations needed to be changed. I, I would just like to get a reflection on how far are we willing to go with biotech applications <coughs> into our environmental side of things. In other words, not the domesticated crops. And surely, uh, open discussion on this, the, trans, uh, uh, the transparency that, that needs to happen. Any, any comment on that? Chris, please. Sure. So um, I think I can comment quickly on both your questions. So the first one about heavy metal uptake, yes, that is one of the things that we're really looking at. So, and uh, we, we're working with a root, apple rootstock breeder. And one of the things he's found is that the ability to uptake these various uh, metals and nutrients is genetic. So there's the potential that we could identify, for example, and, and utilize rootstocks that simply don't take up some of these heavy metals or take them up very inefficiently. And that's really what we're after. And so that's one of the, the, the really great things about tapping into plant genetic resources is their ability to do this. Another, another way we're looking at this is using wild apple species that grow in really marginal lands. And they have the natural ability to, um, to grow and be productive under poor nutrient conditions. So um, the genetics exist, it's just doing the research and uh, finding the, the right combinations to, to create crops that will, will be productive um, in, in the systems that you're, you're trying to design them for. In, in terms of the, the second question about, um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, <laughs> um, I'm sorry, it escaped me now. What was the, the, um, I will remind you if you can just, I don't think he, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. I think the second uh, question related to, uh, environmental engineering almost and engineering or changing wild populations like gene drives? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So a real great example that we have here in the U.S. is actually the American chestnut tree. So um, the chestnut trees back in the 30s, if you're not familiar with this, in the 1930s were essentially wiped out by um, uh, invasive fungus. Um, and they were where we live in the Appalachian region. They were 90% of the forests and nearly gone. And so uh, uh, group American Chestnut Foundation de developed a GE solution. So these chestnut trees are res completely resistant to the fungus and they are currently have an application pending uh, with the uh, USDA and, and EPA in the US to essentially release those back into the forests because those trees are really critical to support native wildlife. So um, they, they, they're, uh, the nuts and stuff they produced is what many of the fauna lived off of. And so um, what's been replaced with that is many invasive tree species, non-native tree species, I should say. So um, yeah, we're looking to really go back almost a hundred years potentially to what our forests look like then. Um, and the impacts of that, it's, it's a huge question um, that I think uh, regulators and society in general has to have, have to make some tough decisions on. Thank you so much. Uh, can I please just ask Peter uh, Bongani, I know you're waiting, but just give it time, Peter, and then uh, Barney, just to also throw in comments about uh, There's engineering. There's lots of examples people have been using about ways they might be able to use genetic manipulation <coughs> to, to influence the environment. We've got one that gets, I think, gets close to what you're asking about. Uh, one of my 
other jobs is I'm a chairman of a, of a small funding agency that invests in genetic applications. And in North America, we have a thing called the buffalo. It's a bison, a North American bison. The natural herds were wiped out pretty much. There are still bison populations, but they intermingled with cattle. And so they're a mixed, they're a hybrid of cattle and, and the original bison, and they're diseased. They have brucellosis and bovine TB. And when they get close to cattle, they spread the disease into cattle and, and can cause epidemics. And right now they're isolated. So that right now there is a project that was just funded working with the indigenous population and, and scientists to see if they can A, clean the disease out of the herd because some of the herds are more resistant. They built up a natural immunity to the disease. So by using a, a clean, a more AI to, to spread the, the disease resistant animals, but secondly then to see if they can selectively work towards cleaning out some of the, the more pernicious parts of the, the cattle uh, genome out of the plant just by, by selective breeding. So there's, they're, they're not GM in the sense that they're going to transgenically modify, but it's, it's very much an environmental rehabilitation program to clean up the, the, the population and then to see if they can return it closer, a bit like our land, return it a bit closer to its natural state. So there's, there's examples like that spread throughout the, the science community, I think. Again, you highlight that it's not just about the technology. You no. can do things in different ways with yep. similar impacts. Uh, Barney, just from your side, I do not expect you to come up with a policy decision. But no, just no, no, yeah. uh, this environmental, obviously, it's a huge impact. Yeah. And maybe in your answer, just refer to, you know, maybe not just the assessment, but looking at environmental um, impact. Uh, what's the other one? Yeah, okay. look, I mean, uh, uh, I think there's an example here in South Africa that, you know, presents, uh, call it an opportunity here to, to test the, if uh, the biotech, uh, I mean, the biotechnology can contribute. We've got a bug that's uh, called, it's known as the polyphagous short hole borer. That's uh, killing trees, you know, and it threatens the avocado industry and possibly other orchards, you know. So um, it, it just gets into the, the tree trunk and then, you know, bores a hole. It's good, carrying a fungus, I think. There's that relationship. And then the tree dies, you know, over time. And the, the concern is that it's spreading now throughout the country. And um, so the worry again uh, for us is uh, what will happen if it gets into the conservation areas, you know, because then it's a big problem because that's an ecosystem and a neat food chain in there. So we've got a couple of people looking at it, understanding the biology of the, you know, bug itself and so on. So I think it's an opportunity there to see if, uh, you know, biotech can make an intervention, you know, to uh, assist, uh, you know, in that. So it's, it's again like in the biological invasion space, but there's that connection now with biodiversity as well. So, yeah. And I mean, that's the approach that we advocate from an environmental perspective that uh, these days with so much knowledge and science out there, I think we are in a space, uh, a position where our approach needs to be what one would call a nexus approach of these things, you know. Otherwise, uh, you know, challenges will pile up and we will never actually, uh, you know, gain any ground in terms of uh, addressing these 21st century challenges. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Purely out of personal interest, um, the shot borer that you referred to, is there any indication that it may relate to changing climate or is it too early to say that? Very good question. Uh, I'm not aware of any studies at the moment, but I think what we are picking up is we're beginning to understand pathways of introductions in certain uh, geographical locations yeah. in the country. That's the next step, actually, to look at, uh, let's model it. Once we understand the biology, to say, okay, where is it going to spread more and what sort of impact is likely to have and under what specific <coughs> conditions? Because we have a very good sense of how climate change is going to play out nationally uh, in terms of uh, both temperature increase. Rainfall is hard to, to like uh, sort of pin down accurately, but we get a sense of uh, what's going to be the rainfall uh, uh, regime uh, roughly, you know, going forward. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Question, please. <coughs> Just by starting with, uh, my name is Bongani. I am from Bayer. 
maybe just by starting with an opening statement, just to reflect that, you know, over the past few years, we have seen, you know, an invasion of, 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 of uh, insect pests such as four lamyworm. We've seen invasion by, you know, some of the uh, invasive weed species, you know, pulmonary alta is one of them. And what specifically what I want to, 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 to ask you, Bunny, is, is that, you know, South Africa has a long history of use of biotech. And we're surrounded by countries that are either have biosafety regulation or non-existent biosafety regulations. And if we were to tackle some of these challenges, obviously, there's a need for a, a regional approach of regional, of, of regional you know, harmonization of these laws as we've seen in other parts of Africa. But there seems to be a challenge within SADC in particular. But what surprises me is that, you know, for, you know, seed regulatory laws, uh, there's harmony there, but harmonization. But w what is, in your view, the challenge with harmonization of biosafety regulations within Southern Africa? Thank you. And you, I mean it at Barney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I think the uh, one is question um, takes us back to Ntakazeni's uh, input yes. uh, earlier on, which I pretty much agree that uh, there definitely is a need for a regional initiative. And, um, uh, you know, through the SADC uh, office, because then it gives it uh, impetus and good grounding if it's coordinated through the SADC office. So if you ask me, the, one of the challenges could be capacity you know, to drive it from uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, pre from those pre SADC premises, uh, basically. So, but things are changing. Um, you have countries now, uh, for instance, uh, I was, uh, uh, you know, with uh, colleagues from Zambia, colleagues from Mozambique and Namibia recently, um, who actually have begun initially, I mean, countries did not have uh, any uh, sort of uh, policy or regulation in place in that regard. But now there's a start uh, where they have uh, regulation in place. And yes, uh, issues are, will be maybe in the, um, you know, capacity for scientific research in the respective countries and so on, which is where SADC could, uh, you know, come in and facilitate that using various platforms that exist you know for instance through the department of science and innovation we could use uh, uh, there is a program through the national research foundation which has a footprint across the SADC. i'm forgetting it now uh, it's uh, i don't know if ben would remember this it's called uh, it's it's about basically climate it's mainly a climate change and a land use um, initiative so it's brought together scientists. I think the office is now located in uh, Namibia. So there are those platforms that we can actually um, sort of latch on to and then build capacity slowly from a scientific uh, perspective. But as South Africa, as I said earlier on, we have put together a regional engagement strategy and it's with clear objectives that this, the first step is to engage. And part of engaging is actually talking about the science, unpacking the science, so people understand the science, because the issue is right there, you know. Uh, there's got to be a clear source of information that is reliable, that unpacks the science. And then once we all understand the science, we agree that, okay, given the, the science, then these are the steps that each one of us in the region needs to take. And then, yeah, the rest will follow uh, in place. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, I see we've got two minutes left. So before I conclude, I just want to circle around back to Kulani quickly. Mm -hmm. Right in the beginning of your first slide, you made this point about stewardship and specifically now referring to biotech crops. Yes. It's from discovery all the way till the, the crop is taken off the market. Yes. So you know that there's been initially a lot of discussion and there are some smaller seed companies that still talk about generics. Yes. You know, using old technology or old line and then putting into their own. What is your interpretation? What is the meaning of 
genetics or not being able to genetics in terms of stewardship issues? When it comes to biotech trades, uh, the biotech trades do get patented, and patents normally last for 20 years, and they expire. So what usually happens after that is there's the difference between crop protection products as generics within the crop protection industry and within the biotech industry. It's the regulatory obligations. So usually, for example, I bring, give an example of South Africa. We get a conditional general release permit, which means every year there are certain reports you need to submit to prove that you have, com you have complied with those conditions. So that permit, there is a potential for it to be withdrawn if you don't comply. That is not linked to the patent. Yes. So that's why it's very difficult to have generic biotech products because of the regulatory obligations or the regulatory environment that governs biotech trades. So that's the major difference between the crop protection industry and the bio agricultural biotech industry. Thanks. Yeah. That's clear. And that's it. According to my watch, the time is over. Uh, thank you for the participation. Um, thank you for the presentations. I think I want to highlight something that Barney mentioned in his presentation. You referred to this collaborative approach that you have, and you refer to specific organizations. What I've heard today, Chris spoke about the products. The technology is, is developing. There's no way that we're going to stop it. There's a need for these things, and that's one of the reasons why it's driven that way. But there's a clear understanding and appreciation from technology developers, the current players, I think future players, hopefully, mm -hmm. will be in the same boat. You know, they appreciate that they do not do this in isolation. They need to you know, take stewardship in the broader sense of the environment. Policy makers know about these things. They know about the potential things. It's not so easy as just, you know, changing two or three words in a, in, a, in a publication, and then we have new systems, but at least there's an appreciation and we're going forward with this. I think the regional aspect is also important one that we should not forget. Unfortunately, regional things, personally, I know I'm guilty of this. I always put it on the back burner because it's so difficult just to discuss the things internally. So adding the complexity of different territories is even more. And then ending off with the farmers. They need the technology. They will use the technology if it adds value to them. One of these values that technology may offer, and again, technology in the broad sense, it's not just about you know, GM or genetic um, genome editing specifically. It's about any technology that can improve the way in which we, we do our agriculture, in, particularly in the current environment and the climate in the figurative way as well, is where we need to look after our environment. And farmers will use that technology because at the end of the day, it's not only about the on-farm benefits of that, but it's about making a product that the consumer wants. So as long as we can talk to each other, I'm, I'm always an eternal <laughs> optimist. We should get there. We, we must just talk to each other. And that's sometimes the frustration that we do not talk to each other. So I hope uh, we leave you with some optimism about the technology and the environment. Thank you.